so much for being here and thank you so much to Aurora for inviting me and to all the EFT people for, for putting on this wonderful conference and giving me the opportunity to come to Valencia, which is such a beautiful city. And I love the, the, the different um, experiments with the different translation, from, translation of translation. It was wonderful. I wish there was a time when everybody could read their different versions. It would be great. So today I'm just going to talk about my, um, my approach to, lit to a particular literary translation, literary poetic translation project. And I know that's very different from the kind of work that many of you do. And I hope there's some kind of resonance or that it might be interesting just to hear about a different kind of related project to the kinds of work that you do. Um, and, I, and I guess I'd be interested at some point, I know there's not going to be Q&A, but at some point I'd be, I'd be delighted to hear more about how it might be the, the kinds of issues I grapple with might be either different to or, or similar to the kinds of things you, you think about in your own work. So I thought, so as Aurora said, I'm going to start not, not by talking primarily about the translation, but I will talk about that in a few minutes. First, I wanted to talk about the reception of my translation, which, as Aurora said, almost all the reception, mostly in the British and American press, but to some extent also in the European press, was to do with the fact that I'm a woman. So it was, it, this was a, it was a headline thing, because I'm a woman. So there was this article in the New York Times, had, it had first woman to translate the other in English. And then every other headline for a long time had woman in the title. Woman, 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 woman. Could the Odyssey have been the work of a woman? No, he couldn't. <laughs> but and yet, because, and I've said several times to people who've asked that, I don't think there's any historical evidence for that whatsoever, but because I'm a woman, they want to put that in the headline. Um, here's woman again, though in fact this piece was saying something somewhat different. I was very, very grateful for the few headlines which didn't have the word woman in the headline. Um, so I think there's issues with this. Um, I have, and I have mixed feelings. I guess I want to just talk, talk through what I think the issues are. On the one hand, um, so, so I, I guess one thing is just that some of these headlines were factually false. There were translations of the Odyssey into uh, many, many languages by women. There's a translation from 400 years ago by a woman into French. There were multiple translations by women into French. There were multiple translations by women into, into Italian. There's a translation by a woman into Turkish, there's a translation by a woman into Dutch, and so on. And so it's to do with this very, very blinkered Anglophone idea that only the Anglophone tradition matters because there are all these others. They're skippable because they're not into English, so it doesn't count. Clearly there's a problem with that. Um, I'm, I'm happy on, on one hand to think that, my, that all this media coverage, in the, especially in the British and American press, might be doing something to invite um, more women to think they could be translators of class classical literature or literary translators, translators in general, there's more visibility about issues of gender, that's a good thing. I also think it's a good thing if there's more awareness coming in, in, in our culture to the fact that, in fact, um, social identities matter, including gender identity, that, that in fact we should have more people, more diversity of people from different social identities, racial identities, ethnic identities, gender identities, doing different kinds of work, and that in fact one should ask the question, who, who is the translator? The translation doesn't actually work like two plus two is four, no matter who does it, you get the same result. You get a different result if different people do it. So I think it's good if there's an increasing awareness about that. I also think that some of the more puffy kind of press coverage didn't take account of three, three facts which I just want to go through. And the first one, I think, is the most difficult one. Um, first is that I think the headline shouldn't have been um, Emily Wilson is a woman, which I don't think is really a headline. The headline should really be why is it the case that vast majority of translations of classical canonical literature into English are by men. That should be the headline, and yet, of course, it's not. Um, so why is that? Why, are, why is there such a male dominance in that particular field? I'm looking around the room, and there's a vast female do dominance in translation and interpretation more broadly. But this particular subset of it, which is the sort of elite, canonical, classical, literary translation, is very male-dominated. There's an issue with that, and I think we should talk about that issue. We shouldn't think this is just normal, and so we can, don't have to talk about it. Um, I think 
there, there, are, there are several factors that cause that, which I'm not going to unpack right now, but I think there are several reasons one could explain from why is that male dominance within this particular field, why is that the case? Um, so the second point I want to make is that being female doesn't in itself guarantee that you're going to have a quote-unquote female perspective or look at things in a feminine, girly sort of way, or even that you're going to be a feminist. There are many women who are not feminists, there are many women who are misogynistic, there are many women who haven't particularly thought about gender bias or gender roles either within their work or within their social lives in general. Um, so you can test this in this particular case if you look at the translations of the Odyssey by women into other languages. It doesn't seem to me that there's a particular sign that the ones by women show extra gender consciousness. I don't think that's the case at all from the ones I've read. Um, in terms of translations into English, I'm not the first woman to translate a Homeric poem into English. Caroline Alexander translated the Iliad into English um, about three years ago, so she should get, be getting lots of shout-outs about that. Um, in terms of style and literary approach, her translation couldn't be more different from mine. We're both women, but the, that fact doesn't predetermine this is how we're going to translate Homer because we're women. It's going to be the women's way of doing it. it that doesn't work at all if you just look at what have two women who've done it done. They've done completely different things. So I guess I would say that my particular interest in gender roles and interest in social hierarchies and inequality is a learned thing and something that comes about through having read more feminist scholarship and thought about it. It's not something that's predetermined by wearing a dress. And then final point I want to make is just that um, people, people by whom I mean just general public but also people who um, have interviewed me um, I think it's a general thing that people don't ask men about gender. People don't say to tr translators of the Odyssey who are men, so how does your being a man affect your work? What, can you tell us about your specific masculine perspective? You must have a real relationship with the male characters. Can you tell us about the male characters in the poem? I, I've read some interviews with other translators of the Odyssey into English, like um, Robert Fagels. Nobody ever asked him those questions. And I actually think they should have done. I think that it's not the case that men don't have a gender identity or their gender doesn't affect their work. It's just the case that we don't make that visible. And that's a problem. And we should st I think we should stop asking women those questions. Because I personally am really bored of being asked those questions. I think we should start asking men about their gender identities instead. Okay. So that was all preamble. And <laughs> you, can, you can hold it in your heads and you can ask me about it at some later point. But so now I'm going to start talking about my approach to translating the Odyssey. So why did I do it when there were already gazillions of translations of the Odyssey out there in English into verse? This is a very selective list of verse translations. Um, in fact, there are far more than this. There are almost 70 translations, published translations, into English already. Why, why would I think the world needed yet another one? Why was it worth five years of my life to, to, to do that? I think it's a good question because, in fact, one could argue the world didn't necessarily need another one. I think it didn't need another one unless it was going to be different from the other ones that are out there. So I was asked to do this project by Pete Simon, who is an editor at Norton, with whom I've been working on the World Literature Anthology and the Western Literature Anthologies published by Norton. So I guess I think it's also interesting that the economics of how do translations, translators get hired are somewhat different, I think, for canonical literary translators as opposed to contemporary literary translators as opposed to all of you. Um, I was excited to be asked because I've always loved this poem, uh, which I think is about questions I think about all the time in both my daily life and my scholarly intellectual life. It's about how, whether we can be the same person after 20 years or in a new place or with new people about how to deal with those who aren't like us, which maybe is everybody. About home, hiding, rage, grief, recognition, imagination, growing up. A poem which turns the details, the concrete material details of everyday life, like food and clothes and moving through space and trees and boats and weapons, into these richly resonant symbols that define relationships both between human beings and between gods and humans. But obviously loving the poem and, want, and wanting to keep on rereading it is a totally different thing from thinking it was worthwhile to produce another translation of it. Um, 
So I, I spent some time before I signed up just looking at some other translations, and then I, I figured I do think I could do something different that is authentically engaged with the original and different from what's already out there. The first thing I, I thought about um, was to do with form. So this is the first line of the poem, and it is in dactylic hexameter. A dactyl is long, short, short. It's like a finger, so a dactyl is a finger, and that's why it's long, short, short. Andra moi ennepe musa polutropon hosmala polla. So it's six like that, and it's like that all the way through. It's that rhythm. Um, and yet, most of the contemporary English translations don't have any rhythm. They're mostly in free verse. These are, this is the first two lines of the oldest translation, which is by the dramatist, um, the verse dramatist George Chapman from 1615, and it's in rhyming couplets. There's also the, the famous Pope translation, also in rhyming couplets. And you can see that both of them um, interpret what's said about Odysseus in the first couple of lines as being to do with wisdom. They both have the word wisdom in it, which I think is, a, I think is an untenable reading of what the Greek is saying, but it's, they're, they're both wonderful translations, but I don't think one can philologically defend what they're making the Greek mean. Um, so, in, um, so the Greek original is, as I, I've said, it's in hexameters, so it's six beats. Many, or several English translations, a minority, but a minority of them, uh, but a small minority, but it'd be possible to translate into English, making it look like hexameters. So quite a lot of translations have a longer line than is usual in English verse. Most of those are not actually hexameters, but they look like hexameters if you kind of squint and don't really read it. Um, so the Latin one, for instance, isn't actually hexameters, but it looks a bit like hexameters. The Rodney Merrill one is hexameters, and it's kind of virtuosic in actually being hexameters. I personally didn't want to do that because there's no native tradition of Anglophone long epic verse in English. So I wanted to use a, a, a native verse form. The much more common thing is to use free verse, which, which doesn't scan at all. It doesn't have a regular rhythm then that's the way that the most famous translations that people usually read do it. You can see that that's the case for the Robert Fitzgerald, the Robert Fagels, the Stanley Lombardo. You can also see, if you, if you can read the text, that these three translations, which are the most common ones that people read, um, are also very similar to each other, not just in terms of form, they're, both, they're all free verse, but also just verbally. If you look at the first few lines, we have the wanderer in Fitzgerald, and then we have in Lombardo the wanderer. We have plundered, and then we have plundered, and then we have plundered. We have time and again in the Fagels, and then we have time and again, again in the Lombardo. So I think that's also a clue to the fact that they were all looking at each other. And they're not, even though there were dozens of these translations, they're not as different as you would hope, which I think is a bad thing. I think we actually need real diversity. So I chose, after I'd done my sort of survey of looking at other translations, I chose not to look at others while I was doing mine. So I chose to use iambic pentameter, which is the native English tradition, and it goes da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum, and it goes like that all the way through. Um, and I also chose because quite a lot of the English translations are very expansive, and in general, there's a tendency for translators to be longer than the original. Right, because the, you, you always have a doubt. Can I use this word, this word, this word? So let me just plunk down three words because you know, I can't quite decide. So I chose not to do that. I mean, I chose to, to limit the capacity to do that by making my version the same number of lines as the original because I thought the rapidity of the original was so important. I wanted to convey something of the musicality, the clarity, the vividness, and the emotional range of Homer, which I felt wasn't fully being conveyed in other versions that I looked at. Um, so it seems to me that we just need to think about what is faithfulness? What is it to be to provide an accurate or faithful rendition of an original text? It seemed to me that it has to do with how does the original read? How does the original feel? How does it make you feel? It has to do with literary form, poetic form, if you're doing a literary translation. Um, it also has to do with style. I aimed for a readable, clear register, avoiding archaisms and foreignisms and high rhetoric as much as possible, 
to bring out the simplicity, the clarity, and the speed of the original. Um, within classics in particular, badly written translations are often highly valued because they replicate the experience of the struggling student in intermediate Greek class. <laughs> so the pain is supposed to be authenticating. But in fact, Homer, once you get beyond the intermediate level, is not that difficult and it's fun to read. So I think there's a, there's a falseness that goes about with thinking, if, it, if it's a classic, it's got to be really hard and unpleasant to read. I don't think that follows at all. I also think we're accustomed to this de debatable binary the translations are either literal or loose. They're faith faithful or they're poetic. But of course, the quote-unquote literal translation is often very unfaithful on the level of form, style, and emotional effect. Clunkiness isn't the same as truth. The real question, I think, for, for literary translators isn't to tell the truth or to tell a pretty lie. It's a much more complex issue about which truths to tell, when there are always many truths you could tell about any original text which can't be fully conveyed in any other language. So a central truth I wanted to tell about the Odyssey was that it's a complex, polyvocal poem. I've seen from, from teaching it, sorry, I'm sorry, I realized I should have talked about this before. I'm just gonna go back for one second. So Homeric poetry is very formulaic and it has a lot of repetitions. I chose not always to repeat in the same way. So I chose to include some variety where the original doesn't always have variety. And I think that's, that's a, obviously a debatable translation choice. It seemed to me that in an oral culture, repetition means something different from what it means in a literate culture like ours. Such that if I repeat it all the time, it wouldn't be the same as the original repeating all the time. It wouldn't have the same kind of effect. Um, so sorry, I'm, 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 I'm aware that we're gonna be on time, so I'm gonna, slightly speed up a little bit. Um, so there's questions about foreignizing, questions about domesticizing. Um, I've seen from teaching the poem that there's an, a, a tendency, at least from undergraduate students that I've taught, to assume that it's a sort of old school comic book superhero story about the un unproblematically heroic male Western hero, implicitly white, who's good because he crushes the bad guys, monsters, foreigners, and witchy women, and understands the value of hospitality, which apparently was important for the ancient Greeks. So you write down the word xenia, and you get an A on the exam. The story has a happy ending because the good guy gets back with the objectified wife, regains all his wealth and all his slaves, so it's a nice celebration of family values, consumerism, patriarchy, war, superiority of normal male white people over the foreigners and the girls. So I don't think the poem is, is that. I think that's a, that's a bad reading of the Odyssey. And so it seemed to me that I wanted to bring out the ways that that's a bad reading and to show how there are so many more voices within this poem than that, so many more ways of reading the central narrative that are critical of that dominant um, story. It's about two central Greek concepts. The first is nostos, which means homecoming. And you might think homecoming was a straightforward thing, just about getting back to where you are. But it's exploring a case where homecoming is as difficult as it could possibly be. And it's showing there are profound questions about the concepts of getting home and of being at home. There were disturbing questions about whether homecoming for one person always means that many other people don't get to go home. So those who translated the first few lines have seen that that's already what's at stake in the beginning, that there's one man who gets back to his homeland, and there are all these other men who do not get home. He leave, Odysseus leaves Ithaca for Troy with 12 shiploads full of young men. Zero of those young men get back home. Some are killed at Troy, some are eaten, some are drowned. Only one man gets home. So it's a poem about how, how so many people don't get home, as well as about how one person does get home. Um, and then I guess also it, it, seemed, it became clearer and clearer to me as I was rereading this poem about how there's all this interest also in the slave characters, all of whom also will never get back home, who don't have a home. Um, the, the second central Greek concept is Xenia, which means the relationship between strangers, hosts, and guests. In the code of Xenia, people have a deep obligation to take care of strangers in need and giving and receiving hospitality. It's a, it creates a bond by which families can form lasting friendships across great distances of space and for many generations. 
Zenia is in many ways an inspiring ideal in these times of xenophobia and of problems with immigration. Thank you, I'm sorry. So thank you so much for saying that. If I'm becoming totally inaudible, please say it again. Yes, thank you. So Zenia is in some ways an inspiring ideal because it's, it's just the opposite of xenophobia, xenophilia. But the poem is also showing us how exclusive the code of Zenia is. It applies only for elite men. When a woman tries to travel, it's Helen of Troy and it's a bad thing. So mostly, it, Zenia is something which can only apply to the ultra-elite man who's in charge of his household, who has the freedom to travel, who can then form a network with other elite men. Um, as in the case of Nostos, the poem is exploring the many ways that Zenia is an exclusive ideal, and the many ways also that Zenia can go horribly wrong such that, for instance, people can go inside each other's homes without actually being a, the right kind of guest. They can go inside the home without being asked, like the suitors who go inside Odysseus's home and eat all his food and drink, and it's a bad thing. Or like Odysseus himself, who invades the native inhabitant, the cave of the uh, Cyclops Polyphemus. He go, goes and tries to take all his sheep without being asked. Turns out badly for both parties. There's also examples, multiple, multiple examples of bad hosts, the ones who don't give you food and drink, but try and make you the food and drink, or who, um, <laughs> instead of keeping you entertained for a little while, try and keep you entertained forever, like the sirens. Uh, or, or the bad hosts who, instead of welcoming the guests, kill them all, as Odysseus does at the end of the poem. So it seems to me that the, the original poem is compelling precisely because of how deeply it lets us inside the perspectives of so many different characters. One example of this is that I've been shocked to realize how, how many translations, even ones who, that have come out after mine, um, use the word slave for characters who definitely are not, are, who use, don't use the word slave. You use words like servant or maid or housekeeper for words which definitely mean slave. And I think that, that tendency to, I think it's definitely a mistranslation, um, is, is in the service of trying to create a heroic narrative, and a simple heroic narrative. If Odysseus is a slave owner, that makes you feel bad about Odysseus. You, you have an uncomfortable feeling, because being a slave owner in our culture is not imagined to be a good thing. Um, but the, the poem is definitely interested in differences of social rank, and if interested in the perspective of the slaves, as well as in the perspectives of their owners and the perspectives of the gods who are above even their owners. Okay, so this is my beginning, which I know that several of you have done interesting different translations of. Um, and so I just wanted to read it and emphasize that part of what I'm trying to do, as I've suggested, is bringing out the different perspectives, as well as having a clear meter. Tell me about a complicated man. Muse, tell me how he wandered and was lost when he had wrecked the holy town of Troy, and where he went and who he met, the pain he suffered on the sea, and how he worked to save his life and bring his men back home. He failed, and for their own mistakes they died. They ate the sun god's cattle, and the god kept them from home. Now, goddess, child of Zeus, Tell the old story for our modern times. So I won't say everything I tried to do there, but I think you can see that I'm trying to bring out how there's multiple different perspectives going on, that, we're de that Odysseus is defined at the start as somebody who's wrecked a holy city, and that there's this complexity about whether he's a passive victim of what happens to him, or is he the agent, is he the one who deliberately wrecked a holy city, who deliberately fails in his responsibilities as a leader, or is he the victim of the gods, who's just swept off course all the time? And I think both those things are there in the text. It's one, one shouldn't try and say there's just one element, he's just the good guy, or he's just the bad guy. Both of those things have to be there at the same time. So now I'm going to turn to a fairly harrowing passage late in the poem, just to talk about how I think it matters whether translators do or don't bring out multiple different perspectives in the text. For those who haven't read the Odyssey, I'm sorry for the spoilers. So Odysseus, um, 
does in fact eventually get back home. He leaves the goddess Calypso and goes through many shipwrecks and all his men are drowned, gets back to Ithaca, he's disguised as a beggar by Athena and he finally manages, with the help of the goddess, as well as his son Telemachus and a couple of slaves, to kill all the suitors who've been besieging, harassing Penelope for all these years. Then Odysseus instructs Telemachus and the others to take the slave women who slept with the suitors outside and hack all the life out of them with long swords. Telemachus, who has been a pretty dopey kid up to this point, then shows uncharacteristic initiative, contradicts his big shot father, and insists that instead they must be murdered by hanging because they're too metaphorically dirty for him to touch with his sword. So clearly there's some creepy psychosexual stuff going on in this very disturbing passage. This is the Greek, and what I want to flag in the Greek is just that, is, I'm not, not thinking that most of you read Homeric Greek, maybe some of you do, I just want to flag the fact that there's no term of abuse of the women in what Telemachus says here. Um, and I also want to, want to flag a few choices that different translators into English of this passage make to show how they can work together to shape the perspective on the narrative. Because I think the crucial question is, is this terrible murder presented as okay by the text? And how the translator operates can, can make a huge difference to whether or not you feel, feel like it's justified or not justified. Okay, so one, one question is, what is this killer like? The Greek says that he's telemachos perpnumenos, which is his standard epithet. It has something to do with he's taken some kind of thought. Has he taken a good kind of thought? That's not clear. Um, calling him thoughtful or stern or cool-headed or sagacious, I think those things suggest he's taken some really good thought. He's thought about this, it's the right thing to do. I don't think it's necessarily the case to, to deduce that from the Greek. Then, are the victims human, and does Telemachus think that they definitely deserved it? Have they done something such that this is a punishment? Um, in Latimore, they're called these creatures, which doesn't correspond to anything in the Greek, but they're dehumanized. In the Fitzgerald, um, Telemachus says, I wouldn't give the clean de death of a beast to trolls, you sluts. Again, doesn't correspond to anything. You sluts, the suitors whores, suitors sluts, and then in the Green translation, there's an extensive footnote on the mechanics of how exactly would you get to kill 12 women with just one rope. You'd think it'd be quite difficult. Let me help you out there with that. How, what, what would the rope have to be like to, get, to achieve that wonderful goal? So uh, there's questions about both the footnoting and how much does the footnoting suggest that the real question here is to do with that kind of mechanics. But there's also questions specifically about the translation. Does the translation suggest Telemachus thinks he's punishing them for, for having done something bad? I personally don't think he's punishing them for having done something bad. I think he's killing them because they make him feel ashamed, which is a very different kind of psychological thing. Another question is about the simile. So there's a great simile comparing these women who are being hanged to birds that are flying into a net. They don't realize they're flying into a net, but there's a net in the bushes, and it catches them, and it's like the ropes that's put, being put around the women's necks. Um, the different ways that translators deal with the simile can work either to dehumanize them, to suggest the women are just birds, so it's like wringing the neck of a chicken, and it's fine. Or, I, the way I read it is very different. I, I think that the simile works to suggest that we can see their perspective. We can see their perspective in the way that we can see the perspective of the birds. We know the birds are trying to get home. Nostos is something which is utterly valorized in this poem. It's a poem which is all about a homecoming. These birds wanted a homecoming. The women wanted a homecoming. They get this horrible thing instead. So it's showing us that there's this, this totally legitimate thing they wanted that they didn't get, which is very different from saying simile works to dehumanize. So I think the choices the translators make about the simile matter, and if you use um, trivializing language like cozy grizzly, it doesn't suggest that they matter. Um, I also think that describing the death as most pitiful um, suggests that there is the possibility of pitying these people, but it's somewhere far away. 
Somebody else might pity them, but I don't have to, because it's just that I've noticed that that is a potentially pitiful thing. So I, th I think there, there are also interesting choices that one could make about whether you think the Greek is saying is doing that, or whether it's not necessarily distancing in that way. And then final thing I want to flag is that there are differences in terms of this horrible final detail that women's feet keep moving, but only for a little while, not for very long. In two of these translations up here, there's a suggestion that these women are party girls. And this is what happens to party girls. Look at them, they're still partying. They danced for a little. They kicked up heels for a little. So you can see why they're dead. And then in the Lombardo, there's a suggestion that they're still birds. They fluttered. So that, again, it's just this is not quite human beings dying. So I didn't want to do those things. It seems to me that the poem has multiple different perspectives on what's happening in Book 22, what's happening in terms of the killings, that it's not all being presented from the perspective of Odysseus. Telemachus' perspective is different from that of the women, different from that of Athena, um, different from, from that of the narrator. And I wanted to bring out these multiple perspectives. So I was going to read my version. Telemachus then took initiative, insisting, I refuse to grant these girls a clean death since they poured down shame on me and mother when they lay beside the suitors. At that he wound a piece of sailor's rope round the rotunda and round the mighty pillar, stretched up so high no foot could touch the ground. As doves or thrushes spread their wings to fly home to their nests, but someone set a trap, they crashed into a net, a bitter bedtime. Just so the girls, their heads all in a row, were strung up with the noose around their necks to make their death an agony. They gasped, feet twitching for a while, but not for long. Okay, so I know that's a very harrowing passage, and I, I don't want everyone to, be, to, to, leave, to end and go for their coffee feeling all upset. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, 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 think I think I just wanted to flag this passage to show how I think there are so, so many different things that translators I, I'm speaking from the perspective of literary translators need to think about in terms of what kinds of fidelity do we need to have? Um, do we need to be faithful to the original, the original language, but also to our own cultural context um, and readerships? And also to think about ethics, to think about the ethics of the text as well as our own ethics. Um, I'm going to end, with, because that was such a horrible passage, by a less horrible one. Um, the, passage which people in antiquity thought should be, some people thought should be the real ending of the Odyssey, which is when Odysseus and um, Penelope finally get reconciled. Um, she's been holding out against him for a long time, even though he kills all her suitors, she still refuses to recognize that he's who he says he is. Um, and she does a trick on him, whereby she says that, um, she says that the slave should pull out the bed from the bedroom which is a trick because he built the bed such that it couldn't be pulled out. It's built out of a tree growing inside the, the, the palace. So it's a sign of both his skill, his power and autonomy over the household, and also supposedly of the idea that this marriage is somehow more permanent than other marriages. So her trick is a way of saying this marriage isn't necessarily permanent. She could have slept with someone else. So a man could cut that bed down. It's not actually as permanent as he thinks it is, there's a way that she's showing him that his power isn't infinite. Um, and he responds with anger, but she, a kind of anger which shows that he's scared. And she responds back with a different kind of vulnerability. So I think it's a, it's a scene in which we can see how two people who have very different levels of power, that she's always going to be less powerful than he is, he is because she's a woman and she can't move, move from her house. Um, that we're shown both their difference and also the, the way they, sh they have a shared bed and also a shared set of histories and also a, a partly shared kind of vulnerability and pain. Um, so the final passage I want to read is the simile, which seems like it's a simile comparing Odysseus's experiences, that he's gone through all these shipwrecks and finally got home. And it turns out that it's not, it's her experiences. So I think it's a beautiful moment when the Odyssey shows how it can think from more than one perspective. The perspective can move around. And through stories, people can experience this deep, imaginative, intellectual connection with peoples who from vastly different life experiences. <laughs>
So he's going to read that passage and then wrap up and we can have coffee. She recognized the tokens he had shown her. She burst out crying and ran straight towards him and threw her arms around him, kissed his face and said, Now you have told the story of our bed. You made my stubborn heart believe in you. This made him want to cry. He held his love, his faithful wife, and wept. As welcome as the land to swimmers when Poseidon wrecks their ship at sea and breaks it with great waves and driving winds. A few escape the sea and reach the shore, their skin all caked with brine. Grateful to be alive, they call to land. So glad she was to see her own dear husband, and her white arms would not let go of his neck.